It's time to introduce another rule. This rule is named the Rule of Indirect Proof, or IP for short. IP for indirect proof. So I've already written out my deal here. Suppose I have an argument composed of P1, as, which is representing a, a premise, P2 representing a second premise, P3 representing some third premise. So I have a three premise argument. Slash tells me that's the conclusion. So let's let P stand for some conclusion that's being drawn. And suppose I want to prove this argument is valid. I want to prove that if the premises P1 through P3 are true, then the conclusion P must be true. Well, here's <clears throat> another way to go about proving this to be a valid argument, proving that that must be true if these are true. Let's suppose that I make an assumption. I'm going to write my assumption right here. I'm going to indent and write an assumption. I'm going to draw a line to set what I'm doing off from what's right under the premises. Why I'm doing this will be apparent later. But I'm going to just make an assumption. My assumption is the logical opposite of the conclusion I'm seeking to prove. So let's suppose I'm trying to prove some conclusion P. I'm assuming as my assumption the logical opposite of P, which would be, would be the negation of P. P with a tilde added to it. All right, so now suppose that I've assumed the negation of P, the negation of the conclusion I'm trying to reach. Assuming the premises are true, assuming my premise here, let's suppose I am able to derive a contradiction. Any contradiction. Where a contradiction is any statement of the form P, and it is not the case that P. So remember the definition of a contradiction. It's a, any statement of the form P, and it's not the case that P. For instance, A and it's not the case that A, that's a contradiction. B and tilde B, that's a contradiction. E and tilde E, that's a contradiction. E ampersand tilde E would be a contradiction. So I've derived a contradiction from the assumption I made, which is the negation of my conclusion, and I've assumed the premises are true and perhaps inferred from them various steps. Let me show you why this proves that the argument must be valid. First of all, assuming that the premises are true, if my assumption is true, the negation of P, then this contradiction must be true. Because this contradiction validly follows from the assumption plus the premises using the rules of inference, each of which is valid. I'm assuming I've derived this correctly using the valid inference rules correctly. But if this follows validly from the assumption, assuming the premises are true, that means that this assumption implies a contradiction. Because if the contradiction follows validly from the assumption, assuming these are true, that means that if the assumption is true, assuming these are true, the contradiction must be true. So this assumption implies a contradiction. Now, in general, if, if a statement P implies a statement Q, you know what that means. It means that if P is true, Q must be true. If Q is a contradiction and P implies Q, then P has to be a contradiction as well. Only a contradiction can imply a contradiction. Here's why. Suppose P implies Q. That means that if P is true, Q must be true. Suppose Q is a contradiction. That means that in all circumstances, Q must be false. Q is never true if Q is a contradiction. But if P implies Q, that means that if P is true, Q must be true. There's no circumstances where P would be true, Q would be false. If P were not a contradiction, then there would be at least one circumstance where P is true. But that would be a circumstance where P is true and Q is false, in which case P would not imply Q contrary to our hypothesis that P implies Q. And therefore, if P implies Q, 
and Q is a contradiction, motorcycle thing going on there. If P implies Q, and Q is a contradiction, P has to be a contradiction too. Only a contradiction can imply a contradiction. That's a general principle of logic. So what this little uh, experiment shows is that granting the premises are true, if we assume that the negation of P is true, that logically implies a contradiction, which shows that assuming the premises are true, this must be contradictory as well. And of course, if this is contradictory, it can't be true, it must be false. And its opposite, its logical opposite, must be true. And so, we've now shown that assuming the premises are true, t the negation of P must be a contradiction, it must be false, which means that P must be true, because P is the logical opposite of not P and P is the contradiction. The logical opposite of a contradiction is always true. And so this, is, uh, this procedure is uh, encapsulated in a rule called indirect proof. Indirect proof says this. It says, given some proof, anywhere in a proof, either at the beginning or anywhere in the middle of the proof, you may indent you may draw a line like this, and you may make an assumption. Your assumption will be the negation of the formula that you're seeking to prove. So if you're seeking to prove a formula P, you would assume the negation of P. For instance, if I was trying to prove a formula A, I would assume as my assumed premise tilde A. If I was trying to prove a formula B, I would assume as my assumed premise tilde B. If I was trying to derive a conclusion tilde E, my assumed premise would be tilde tilde E. Because the assumed premise is always the same as the premise you're trying to prove, except it has a tilde added to it. So if I'm trying to prove tilde E, I would assume tilde tilde E. And then once you've done that, you label it, you write AP, stands for assumed premise. What this tells your reader is you've made an assumption. You've just, you've indented to set this off from the ordinary steps in a proof. I'm just assuming the negation of P as sort of a logical experiment. And then the steps inside the indented subproof, this is called an indented subproof, are demonstrating that a, con a contradiction follows from the assumption using the premises if necessary. Usually they will be. Once you've reached a contradiction, once you've reached any contradiction, you, you are allowed to disindent and assert the conclusion you originally sought to prove, which will always be whatever the logical opposite of this is. If you assume not P, then you're trying to prove P, and you would write P. And then to justify that, you write IP for assumed premise, and you cite the indented lines four through, and I'm supposing this is, there's a certain number of lines here, I call this one line N, so four through N, pretending there's several lines in there. And this justifies in inferring P. Now the lines that are in the indented subproof don't follow from the premises. We indent them to remind ourselves that this is an experiment. These, these don't actually follow from the premises. Now I do know because of this, because assuming not P led to a contradiction, I know that not P must be false or contradictory as well and therefore this must be true if these are true, so I can write P here. I now know that P follows from the premises. I could keep going and infer further statements, and sometimes you'll do an in a indirect proof in the middle of a proof after you've inferred a number of things. The rule is that once you have disindented from the indented subproof, and that's called discharging your assumption, You've discharged your assumption. You've told that it, you're done with it. You may not, if you go on in the proof, refer to any of these lines if you derive further lines. You may not use these to derive further lines. 
And the logical reason is that this is an experiment, it's a hypothesis, but none of these actually follow from the premises. But because of the logic I explained a few minutes ago, we do know that if we indent, assume the negation of what we seek to prove, if we then derive a contradiction from that, that shows that what we initially sought to prove must follow from the premises alone. So that's the rule of indirect proof. And in the next little episode, I'll do an example and uh, we'll talk through it step by step.